No, this is the CSO panel, and we have a lot of volume. There we go. All right. So my name is Patrick Larry. I'm the speaker chair, and decided to moderate the CSO panel. This was actually somebody else's idea on the committee, and then we asked him, "Do you still want to do it?" And he said, "Nah." So I said, "Okay, I'll do it." Well, <laughs> anyway. All right. So what we have today is going to be six. CSOs, Chief Security Officers, Chief Information, uh, people in charge of security of companies. And the six that we have here represent tech, tech banking, higher education, and a nonprofit. So we have a bunch of questions. And, and healthcare. And healthcare. And healthcare. <laughs> I'm <laughs> actually three of those: of healthcare, yeah. academic, and nonprofit. So. Yeah. All right, so that's going to make this next one even more interesting. <laughs> since the next one was, I was going to ask them to answer questions from their own individual perspective, and not anything like I would think in other industries they would do things. And that's why we tried to get a little bit of a diverse board here, so that way each of them could kind of answer the questions from their own industry perspective. So, uh, what we are going to start with and probably not in the same order that they're actually sitting up there, is going to be some introductions. So we have from Akamai Technologies, and I guess the wrong logo up there is what I've been told. It's about seven years old. Oh, oh, oh. Google fell. He, he's going to fire me. Um, You're done. <laughs> which actually, disclaimer is, I used to work for Andy, but I don't anymore. So, um, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Andy? So I'm Andy Ellis, I'm the Chief Security Officer for Akamai. I've been at Akamai for 16 years. And in addition to doing security governance across the entire business, uh, also gotten to work on the product side, helping launch a lot of our new products. Um, before I was at Akamai, I was in the Air Force doing information warfare. Right. Thanks. Next to him, which is also curious, we have Josh Feinblum from Rapid7. Who now can fire him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we also have a disclaimer on that. I work for Josh. Okay. <laughs> Josh, want to introduce yourself? Man, that introduction is great. Um, I can't actually fire him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if not, you can ask somebody to. You've got honestly <laughs> back in the crowd. Uh, I'm the head of, Josh Feinblum, I'm the head of security at Rapid7. Uh, for Rapid7, I spent time in high growth healthcare companies and uh, working in various telecom companies and uh, law enforcement agencies and you know rinse and repeat federal agencies. So I, you know, spent a lot of time getting different perspectives and found out my home was in high growth, high tech companies, and I just happened to also land the security company, which. Uh, a has allowed me to build a different type of team and experiment a little bit more, and B has started to give me an opportunity to delve more into product and building a stronger community and uh, helping our customers be successful uh, just as a function of, of what's expected of my job instead of you know going out of my way and having people look at me and saying, why are you why are you here secure? It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. All right. And next to him, from Century Bank, we have Adam Glick. I can say that I don't work for Adam. <laughs> but do you bank with him? <laughs> I've actually worked with him. I, I was going to say, I'm, uh, also I can't fire Pat, but uh, it's not with that attitude. <laughs> so I am uh, Adam Glick, as mentioned. I'm security officer for Century Bank. Uh, a lot of you may, may or not have seen our logo. We're uh, $5 billion bank right here in Medford, um, community bank relatively small in that sense, but uh, I am responsible for security and all those big jargon and buzzwords that are associated with it. Thank you. Great. And from Northeastern University with Mark Nardone. So I'm Mark Nardone, uh, Chief Information Security Officer for Northeastern. Um, I've been in information security since about 2002, which was about the year after Northeastern started to have an information security function. So I got to evolve as the program evolved, and, and now I run it. And so, and at the end, from Cyber Discovery Group, John Creekmore. All right, thanks, Patrick. Uh, so my name is John Creekmore. I work as a Chief Security Officer for the Cyber Discovery Group. It's a uh, 501c3 in research and development, education, and cybersecurity. So uh, personally about me, um, everything I say is my opinion. It doesn't represent my employer or anyone in the contract with at this time. Um, additionally, at this time, I've got about close to 13 years doing uh, pretty much consulting pro bono, as well as support work for a lot of nonprofits and security. Um, that's pretty much what we work predominantly with, is supporting people through security efforts for nonprofits. And uh, we like working in the trenches with those people, because uh, you discover a lot of cool things. 
That's it. Great. Thanks. And what, last night I was creating these name tents that Andy has so nicely recreated for himself. And one of the things that I was noticing was that we didn't have a whole lot of diversity with them. Excuse me. I think we skipped. No, not yet. Yeah, let's get to that. Power now. I was reading the tents and noticed we did not have a lot of diversity. And today, Josh came up to me and said, we would like to add another person to your CSO panel. Do you mind? And I said, oh, that would be awesome. So from Tufts University, we have Sonia Arista. I have the diversity on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so pleased to be here. I manage uh, information security for Tufts Medical Center and the Floating Hospital for Children. Been there about 10 years, um, but always in the healthcare space. I worked, uh, did some work for Harvard Pilgrim and Neighborhood Health Plan before that. And before that, I did uh, management consulting work out of uh, Texas, out of uh, Dell Services and Ross Perot's uh, management consulting group. So there's a lot of, a lot of verticals in there um, in terms of clients, but really specifically focused in healthcare and love working um, in the hospital space. Thank you. All right. So basically what we're here for is to ask them questions and hear some of their answers. So we can start with some really easy ones for them. How about, what does a CSO do? What's your typical day look like? And take us through some of the typical things that happen in a CSO's day. Let's see, who has a microphone wants to start? You got it, Mark? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it works. <laughs> the cool things about being an information security officer in a higher ed is I never really know what I'm going to do day to day. I try to plan my days as best I can, but they don't always turn out the way that I plan. Um, certainly, what I had, what I do is evolving uh, as the maturity of our program at the university is evolving, as the university's profile is evolving, uh, the challenges continue to increase. I do a lot of meetings with general counsel, risk and compliance. Uh, talking about strategies for implementation for new things that Northeastern want to do, like putting brand new uh, CMS systems or LMS. Um, strategy seems to be a big part of my job now, uh, and trying to lay out how the university positions itself for all the things that it wants to do, and still protect the infrastructure and protect the data that we have on a daily basis, and then there's also red handle days. Just red handle goes down, and you're in crisis mode, and you're incident response. So the the, the key point that I I heard there, which I agree with, is your day is totally not predictable from a long form perspective, and that's an executive function. That's not a security thing, right? As you, the higher you go in an organization, the less you're doing routine things because that's what you have grown a team, is to take care of the things that are somewhat predictable. And much of your day is handle escalations, right? Talk about the things that are off track and how do you get them back on track. Care and feeding of your staff becomes a much larger and larger portion of your job. Larry's over there going, man, I clearly don't get fed because I'm short. <laughs> but it's ensuring that people have the challenges that are in front of them and th that they're suited for. Right, so that they can grow and develop. You don't take a junior contributor and say, oh look, I think someday you could be a senior architect, so let me put that job in front of you today. It's how do you ensure that that work is being put in front of them in a way that's consumable, that they can grow, that your managers are doing the same, that your directors are doing the same. So a lot of it really has to do with sort of watching this machine and making sure that it's on track within your organization and that it's fitting within the larger organization. You know, I think the simplest way to explain it is frequently hurting cats, which is a lot of what uh, Andy just said. And it's not an exaggeration. I think one of the really fun things about security security teams in uh, especially places of, of uh, like rapid growth or high technology places, uh, you, you have the opportunity to understand the business uh, both from a strategic level and a tactical level in a way that doesn't exist in, in almost any other component of that business. And so I think that uh, one of the one of the things that I've, I've always enjoyed the most about it is that you can really get in and gain and both gain a different perspective and give the business back a perspective that they're not used to, uh, and and I think that aligns directly with uh, with being a, both a tactical and strategic contributor. And so I don't want to echo. I mean, obviously the same things that all these guys said, but I think that there's very very fun perspective that we get that a lot of others don't don't. 
Yeah, I think um, in addition to that, the only thing that I would I would really add to my role um, day to day is being a, a constant evangelist and uh, lobbyist for security and why security is important to the various individuals you know working in the organization. So. I talk daily with physicians and understand how they're using technology and remind them that security is a big component of the patient experience and patient trust as it relates to the health, you know, the hospital environment. Um, but that constant kind of lobbying for the program to uh, mature within the organization, I feel, is my largest role. Uh, yeah, so ditto to uh, the previous four uh, panelists. Um, very much uh, along with Andy's sentiment is that it is much of the unknown is what I would walk into every day. Um, we are a financial institution, so I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that a large portion of my time is taken up by auditors. Um, we're audited five or six times a year, so I am in with Deloitte, KPMG, the Federal Reserve, FDIC, whoever it might be. Um, flavor of the week at that point is, is a good portion of my time. Um, but yeah, you know, the day to day, you, you come in and you're unknown, uh, you got to handle the reports. There were changes yesterday, what happened, what was it? Um, very much responsive uh, in nature, unfortunately. Okay, so let me take a caveat and define people at this point. Um, uh, so, coming from the background, we're in nonprofits, you have almost a non existent budget, so there's a lot of volatility in your daily schedule. Um, managing security projects, nonprofit, has been rather interesting. Uh, because they all have different policy standards and things that we enable uh, those people with. I do think, though, that they've all hit on it. A systemic uh, success factor actually is personnel management, as well as communication and knowing your team. Uh, you, as a CSO, you're actually working uh, rather hard to be that communication bridge a lot between your enablers and the people who make the decisions in the business. So uh, regardless, I mean, I've seen it from multiple industries at this point. A lot of it really boils down to uh, being a communicator um, and being able to be a team player John, uh, John, I'm going to come right back to you. Okay. So, let's see. All right. What's the number one thing that you struggle with each day and wish you could get a better handle on? Or what's the one takeaway you would like to see each of us leave here today that will make the security environment better? Okay, so tackling the first one, um, the number one thing we struggle with every day with nonprofits, if can anyone guess, how we want to work really hard for little to next to nothing, right? So uh, obviously financial constraints of accomplishing the objectives of the organization is always going to be systemic for nonprofits. Um, so that, that is absolutely the number one thing is innovating alternative methods to accomplishing your goals. So uh, he mentioned earlier about being a tactical and strategic. You have to be able to have a team that can um, have the agility to go through a uh, decision process where you go from being tactical to strategic on a rapid notice and one right back. Um, and then one of the one takeaway is actually probably would be that is to uh, if you do anything, especially nonprofits, you have to work a lot with people coming to you and wanting to help with the mission or the organization. Um, maximize the potential that your people have. So those personal management strategies again. But also one thing I don't think a lot of people uh, see with nonprofits often is stakeholdership. So making every single person feel like everything they do is detrimental to the success of the organization. Uh, I think it's absolutely a key takeaway if you do anything as a team leader. Mark, how about from the university perspective? <sighs> takeaway? I mean, uh, it's it's really getting people to understand that they're as much part of the solution as they are sometimes part of the problem. Um, and, and making people learn that integration security is something that should be baked into their daily job, their daily lives. I mean, that's one of the things that we push really hard for when we do our information security awareness training is, it's like, okay, it's not just your eight to five job that you should be thinking about these things, it's also on the outside. Um, so really kind of driving those things home uh, is, is super important. Um, I mean, what day-to-day uh, -day struggle, for me right now, it's it's finding the resources to continue to grow the program the way I want it and the university needs it to grow. Um, it's tough because we're a university and we are a nonprofit, uh, so the, the, the pool of money is small. Uh, and if anybody's from around this area, area, you'll know the kind of meteoric rise of North Northeastern over the last 15 years. 15 years ago, we were ranked in the 300s, and now we're in the top 50 uh, universities in the country. Uh, and that has brought some very unique challenges to us, not the least of which is the fact that people now know our name, which means people in China know our name. Uh, so you'd be really surprised at the increase 
profile and attack vectors that are coming at this now because we're on NPR or there's a news uh, article in the New York Times that cites our name. Um, and finding the resources to not only keep, keep the university safe, but also to continue to move forward strategically uh, to position us better to meet those challenges, that's, that's the big struggle for me, is trying to find those dollars. Sonia, you described a couple, three different industries, I think, that you kind of cover in your position. Do you think there is one thing that you struggle with, or is it because you worry about so many different things that there are not one thing? Yeah, so I view my organization through the lens of, you know, you look at research, you look at, you know, nonprofit, academia, obviously large uh, consumer component with uh, providing health care to the masses, um, and, and the non-for-profit component of the organization. So. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I have to view the, the organization in those three different spaces, and I've really leveraged leadership in those spaces and gotten them ramped up within security, um, you know, knowledge, so that I have some visibility that's spread, because it, even if my team were seven people, I still wouldn't be able to look at security through the lens of what they're, uh, what they're facing day to day. Um, I think the biggest struggle for me that really is getting on top of the technology that's coming into my organization. So if you think about how, how you know, we're in the middle of Boston, you know, epicenter of great development from a software perspective, a lot of big healthcare uh, companies and, and small, you know, incubators developing software applications to use on your phone that'll transmit health data to your physician and, and all of your friends on Facebook if you want to. Um, uh, and and so that's kind of one component of it. Uh, there's an influx of telemedicine-based uh, medical devices that are now going to have random operating systems that are not haven't been a part of the program uh, historically. So that's a, a big challenge for me. Adam, you went from academia to banking. Sure. So did. how would you see this <laughs> these questions? being eye-opening for you when you went to the banking sector? Yeah, so it's a, obviously I don't need to tell you, it's a, it's a world of difference when you're talking about the financial sector from the higher end, uh, higher ed sector. Um, higher ed is very much I an open environment. It's, you know, how can we communicate freely? How can we enable this technology? And then it's kind of at the end of the day, hey, by the way, should we add SSL to that? Or, you know, maybe should we add some sort of security to it? Um, whereas the financial sector is very much the other way around. So the financial sector is, okay, is it secure? Is it a, you know, button down, do we have all the configuration cor correct? Okay, maybe we should think about adding a user in and see if they can use the technology. <laughs> um, so it's kind of this, you know, which end of the tunnel you're really looking at. Um, but as far as, you know, related to the question, one thing I struggle with, uh, my big struggle right now <laughs> is the, uh, the Swift network, if anyone's familiar with that. Uh, explaining to my executives that yes, we have more than $10 routers and we do have something called the firewall on our network. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult to say, yeah, I've got it, and also said, try to explain to them what it is. Um, but it goes back to the initial question of, you know, every day is different. I did not know I was going to have to come in and answer a bunch of Swift questions one day, um, and now I find myself doing it. But uh, I struggle with that. I struggle with user awareness, uh, getting my users to understand and be a part of the culture. Uh, I find that to be extremely valuable from a security standpoint. I want people to take Century security uh, as part of something that they are a part of. Uh, and by doing so, they're secure in their professional environment and they're secure in their personal environment. Um, we work really hard at that. And uh, I understand I'm keeping you guys from beer, so I'll, I'll button it up one last one. <laughs> um, Takeaway from this, I think a you know bit of a paradigm shift from the security world. Uh, I try to be an enabler in the most positive sense of that. Um, if someone says, oh, we can't do that, I want to find out how we can't do that. No, that service isn't allowed. Well, let's find something that is allowed. Let's find a secure way of doing it. Let's, you know, let's not be that, that breaking point. Let's be the, the enabling point of that. So that's my takeaway. Josh, are you going to do that? All good? You know, the one thing that I, I was actually surprised at in here was, I'd say, my biggest struggle, both for I, I myself and we, the team, is prioritization. Like, figuring out what I want to get, what I want personally, and what I want the team to get an A-plus on, and what we, what's okay to get a C on. I mean, a lot of times it just feels like you're rolling the dice, uh, especially when you're dealing with, you know, a smaller organization. Uh, you know, sometimes it just it feels like you're guessing. It's, it really comes down to intuition uh, uh, and and ultimately instinct. And I don't know. I, I'm interested if you you share that in a larger uh, larger organization. 
Um, and I'd say uh, the takeaway uh, is that you know, I think that the industry in many respects has become very pessimistic, and I actually am optimistic. I think that there are really complicated problems that we can solve uh, if we get curious, highly apt, and uh, excited people uh, that are good at solving problems. And so when you're going out and hiring, uh, it's something I learned from this guy actually is you know, don't you don't need to go find that security engineer with uh, five years of experience. You can get creative and try and find uh, find uh, creative uh, creative and energetic people that are really smart, and they're going to help you be very successful uh, when you're building your program. Yeah, that's that's a neat tangent for India to go off on. Maybe talk about what Josh was just describing, the kinds of people that you look for. Yeah. So I was going to go with the struggles, but I don't have any, so. <laughs> <laughs> Security's easy. Yeah. No, Keeping so, good staff. Yeah. Keeping good staff. So no, no, no problem. <laughs> 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 oh, no problem with that. How much bed time? Five o'clock in. <laughs> so, well, so to that point, so like, let's take Larry. For those of you who weren't here in the previous talk, Larry's the guy who broke CVE and uh, failed to find 1,300 WordPress vulnerabilities at once. Found 30 instead. But like we hired Larry, and Larry wasn't officially a security person, right? His resume was been his sysadmin yeah. for God, I don't even know how many years, like since before there were computers, um, <laughs> right? Great security researcher. Yeah, you know, we hire from places, and sometimes you make mistakes when you do that, right? You don't always find the best fit, and so one of your struggles is how do you take somebody because everybody has value that they bring into your organization, and put them in a position where they'll thrive. Because when somebody isn't thriving, more than half the time, it's not their fault. It's the fault of the organization, of how you supported them, of how you trained them or didn't bother to. Um, and we've done you know, almost every mistake imaginable, um, although I'm sure we'll discover some more next year. I have very inventive managers that work on ways to fail and new, new opportunities. Um, but to the second one, um, the one thing I want everybody to take away with is you know, in your career at some point, probably on a regular basis, you or one of your coworkers will engage with the business in a dynamic in which the security person is holding themselves up as protecting the business and trying to stop this stupid or evil person from doing a thing. Cut it out. It's not helpful, right? We as security personnel do not make money for the business. Right? Our job is not to keep them from taking risks, it's to help them make better risk choices. And any dynamic in which you say that they're the villain, which obviously means you're the hero, is exactly the opposite. We are sidekicks. We're an industry where the best we get to be is Robin. <laughs> right? We are not Batman. We are not Superman. We're not even Aquaman. <laughs> let alone like Wonder Woman. Like that would be I I'd kill to be Wonder Woman. I'm Robin. Right? I'm running around and maybe I help Batman remember to put on his utility belt. <laughs> That's what our industry is. There's there's something that Andy said once several years ago that I actually whenever I'm sitting down with business and I'm going, Oh my god, what is what is happening? He said something very similar, which is no one is the villain in their own movie. And so whenever I'm getting frustrated, or, or as I tell, I tell the same thing to every, every person on my team at some point, is when somebody is coming back and saying something that you think is the most ludicrous thing you've ever heard, like you can step back and try and make sure, you don't try and make sure you understand their perspective and why they feel that way. All right, so I got this next one, probably a little bit more for Andy and Josh, since they actually do have staff here. How can your staff and other people at your company better serve you? It's often said that executives serve. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. All right, can you give us some water? It's often said executives don't want problems brought to them by their staff. They want solutions offered, ideas suggested to fix problems. Is that it? So I've, I have said that to people, and I increasingly feel like that's an untruth when I, when I tell that to folks. I do want to know what the problems are, even if you don't have a solution. Now, that doesn't mean that the fact that you found a problem that you think is crazy existential doesn't mean I'm going to do anything about it. Because guess what? I've got to register some crazy existential problems that I can't do anything about anyway, and this might just go on it. So some of it is that level of tolerance to understand that when you find a thing, that you're traumatized by that might actually be reasonable within the, the or, within the organization. So accept that it's it's going to go up and it's not going to bounce. It's just not going to move the organization. 
Um, but also expect that if you bring me a problem without a solution, and it's a problem that I think I know what a solution is, I'm just gonna tell you what to go do. Like if you walk in and say, hey, I got a problem like this, and you stop, I'm gonna say, okay, go do this, 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 and this. Like I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, if you want somebody just to be able to talk to for a minute, you gotta start by saying, like, hey, I'm frustrated about this thing. I want to tell you about it, and I don't want any action from it. <laughs> but if you walk in and say, I'm having a problem with my manager, I'm like, great, let me solve it. I'm a troubleshooter. That's what I do for a living. So that that's the one thing that I think, and I, most of my folks are pretty good about learning that one, but that's a big piece. I, I would say that I, I encourage as much open dialogue as possible. And so... It's never a, if you don't have a solution, don't, don't come. Uh, what I don't like is I don't like people to complain a ton and, and never try and offer a, you know, a valuable approach to the things that are bothering them. It's just constant complaining. I think that's different than coming with a real problem and, uh, uh, and working through it as a team. But what I, what I don't like, because I don't like when people uh, in the security industry in general go to the business without a solution. Right? You, like, you, we can't just be people that point out problems. Right? So the most important thing is that when we see a problem or there's something that uh, we're uncomfortable with, uh, that we're not just going and saying no, it's, hey, how about this? Or if, if you can't do it this way, maybe we can help you do it that way if you don't have the resources to. Uh, which isn't always practical with all security organizations, uh, you know, for obvious staffing reasons, but it's, it's a really important focus that you're just not the team of no. I know you guys have started to hear that, but if that's, if that's what your team is doing, you're, you're just not gonna be successful as a team. Sonia, I think you said you had seven people, and even if you had more, that wouldn't be enough? Oh, no, I don't have seven people. Oh, okay. <laughs> I said even if I had seven people. Oh. Um, uh, th th one you thing can have that Patrick. I guess it's No. <laughs> 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 um, one thing that I guess I'd just to tag off of that, you know, it's I think we get uh, tagged as a team of no, and so one of the things I implore people to do is invite me to the meeting, because I'd rather see the wreck ahead, right? Or if a new technology is coming down the pipe or they are planning on you know, doing something strategic that involves a new application that is fraught with security holes like Swiss cheese in the code, I want to know about it and make other you know, mitigating decisions um, on it. John, how does this work with your office? Oh man, um, everyone on my scene, since we are a security nonprofit internally, is probably better than I am, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm the guy that's the extrovert, the ENTJ, as they call it in the psychology world, apparently. Um, but I know that I have to go to bat and just trust pretty much everything that they do for me. To better serve me, um, they could stop bringing me solutions for our clients, basically, because they don't stop. Like, it's just, hey, we could do this, this, and this. And nine times out of ten, it's a matter of, okay, with what resource and time? Um, but no, it's, it's really honestly, it's about communication. I and mean, they already talked about it, being very transparent with your team. Um, at times, I would like to be more involved, as she said, with things that may seem minute to someone or they may seem so they don't have a solution to that problem. Uh, Cross-pollinating across the board can actually develop a lot of things. Like the CFO um, may know something. I've got a CEO in this room for a medical startup I buy today. Um, I mean, you know, that person, how often do you see a CEO? Anyone here a CEO? Other than, okay, good, that's awesome. We need more of those, right? Um, so actually asking something back on the top side can also help out, I think, you know, not just the people that serve you, but the, the people that you work for as well, if you can. And Mark, do you want to add anything? You're good. Yeah, I mean, I'd just say I you trust your team. Uh, you know, you hire them for a reason. They're usually, as I said, smarter than you, but what they do. Um, Make sure that they understand that it's okay to get it wrong sometimes. Uh, and don't penalize them for that. Just look at it as an opportunity to get it right the next time. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, to, to Mark's point and Sonia's and John's point also, um, I, I really appreciate open communication. So, it, you know, it, it's going to upset me more if, you know, they come to me on a Friday and say, hey, we've been banging our heads against the wall since Monday on this. and. <laughs> We've made no progress, and we're still dealing with it. I'd, I'd wish you'd came to me earlier, and um, uh, you know we, we've gotten to these points, and we're we're being um, paid to be solution providers. I think um, at at this level in our job, so uh, open dialogue is, is extremely helpful. Um, talking through it, whatever the case may be, but um, bring us in the loop. Uh, and I 
every year. Right. All right, for this next one, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal balls, and hopefully with the different industries, we get different answers. What do you see as the next big thing that security practitioners will have to face and deal with over the next few years? Who wants to jump in on that one first? I want to jump in on this question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a security vendor. I'm going to say, ironically, that I think that you like, like you're like a huge monolithic more than security vendor. Like, <laughs> security is important, but you do a lot of other really cool things. Um, I would say that uh, the fact that security t tooling is failing us. I mean, like, like if you were a security practitioner and all you do is install security tools, you're not a security practitioner. You're a tools <laughs> practitioner. Uh, security practitioners are innovative. They're intuitive. They've learned how to uh, automate problems and solutions. Uh, they don't sit there and click the same button every day over and over because they go, hey, that's not effective. Like that's something I should be able to make happen automatically. And so I think what if I had a crystal ball, it's you know what what a practitioner is and how we start addressing problems is going to be much more oriented around. Uh, it's much more oriented in Christian interests in uh, building it into solutions instead of trying to buy things and bolt it into our environment. So f first, I've got a protest. I'm a security vendor, 250 million in security revenue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time we've broken out our revenue for anything and it's for security, so I'm so excited. Okay. He's been, been, waiting, been waiting to drop that. Exclusive security oh, vendor. Okay. Right, better? That's much better. Um, no, so actually, I think that it's the, there's an approaching complexity, apocalypse, singularity, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, and here's a simple anecdote for you. How many people in here are automotive engineers? Great, no hands went up, so I've got no ringers in the room. <laughs> people remember the story of the Ford Pinto? Put a gas tank right at the very back when you got rear-ended, it leaked? Yeah. How many of you think that's a good idea? Again, none of you. You're all lay people, and you can all understand how the Ford Pinto was badly designed. The Jeep Cherokee that was taken over <laughs> at top speed by a number of you know, researchers that were always supposed to credit, and I don't want to like blank on Newt Haberdash or Charlie Miller's name, so I see you. <laughs> I love their Twitter name. Um, now, what did they do wrong? Anybody here know what is the simple design failure of the Jeep Cherokee? There's like 18 things that go wrong, right? It's not one, like, there's the one simple we can the talk about, fired. but the lay person <laughs> can't look at that and say, here is the one bad design failure that went into that. Systems are now so inherently complex that we can no longer look at them and go, this is safe or this is not safe. And that makes doing risk evaluations really hard. Because here's the other dirty little secret of our industry. Quantitative risk assessment doesn't work outside of the actuarial industries. Like if you're doing fraud or insurance on large populations, great. Other than that, all risk management is done from the gut. We're papering it over with these beautiful reports that say what we should do. But then it's a gut check. We think we need more security? Sure. Go to risk assessment so I can figure out which things I'll go do. But it's only started because somebody believed that there was a problem. We're losing the ability for lay people, and by lay people that includes the three CEOs in the room, um, and all of us, if you're not a systems architect, you're looking at some complex system that you're building and trying to judge its risk, and we no longer have the tools to understand how these systems operate. And that's the thing that really worries me, is will security increasingly become a cargo cult where we just you know, tell people, well, go rotate your password every 90 days, because that's what we've always done, even while that's no longer an interesting problem mm -hmm. or solution. Yeah. Sorry for the soapbox. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you know, we're going to continue to see the cyberification of traditional crime models. Right? Yeah. I think yeah. that's the thing that we've seen over the last scary. 15 years. You, know, you had vandalism with people just you know, defacing websites, and then we had theft. And you stole your credit cards and your data, and and now we have, you know, kidnapping and ransomware, uh, which is the next thing. And it, it, even it's evolving because now it's starting to cut your fingers off and send them back to you as it deletes your files when you don't pay. Um, and I think that's it's not going away. The, the FBI, I think everybody knows, the FBI have said that ransomware is going to be a billion-dollar business this year, um, and it's it's just never ending. Um, and I think adding to the complexity of the Internet of Things, that's just going to open more opportunities for these, you know, traditional crime models to move into the cyberspace. And Adam, we all have bank accounts, so this should be interesting to see what you're worried about. <laughs> 
Uh, I like Mark. What was the word? Cyber advice. Cyber. 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 Vacation. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, I wish I had a. Too like the bank has. Coin that. No, I wish I had a a nice metaphor that like Andy had, but um, I, I'm with Mark on kind of that that what we've seen in the past for regular crime taking on that digital life. And uh, I think one of the, you know, and again, if I knew what was going to be the next big thing, I'd be talking to my brokers right now and, and not talking to anyone else here, but uh, I don't know what it is. So I think kind of that IoT that Mark kind of led on to is as we start putting on more and more things to the internet without truly understanding uh, the proper ramifications of, you know, how to secure, you know, a, a simple bus within, um, you know, Jeep Cherokee like that, you know, so that someone can't tap into your car and turn it off while you're driving on the highway. We're, we're missing that full understanding of the implications of when we add these things and I'm sure Sonia can talk more about uh, from a healthcare standpoint of you know adding a heart rate monitor and things like that to the internet. Um, the personal devices, all the wearables, all that stuff are becoming more and more relevant um, and I'm, I'm just cautious uh, that no one is watching the watchtower at that point. Yeah, this morning when Mudge was talking about how one of the car companies sent out a USB to upgrade the firmware. So I'm I'm really still glad that the, I'm hoping the healthcare industry doesn't do that for pacemakers or something like that. But Jam this into your nipple. We all laughed at that. The but well. what would you have them do instead? Like, think through the alternatives of how See, else they could distribute a firmware update. We can send it over the internet. And you can download it to your pacemaker. Does that no, sound like a better in the body. idea? <laughs> like, we have somebody hand type it. Oh, that really makes me scared. Like, so we don't give them good solutions. Carry so a drone delivered. You know, Carry a wetsuit. Yeah. Amazon drone <laughs> delivered to you. <laughs> like, there's no good that solutions, that and so it's easy for us to say to make fun of the ones they choose. But at the end of the day, the larger IT industry has mm -hmm. failed. Yes. To create means that will work for businesses, so businesses ignore us because yes. we haven't helped them solve their problems. Yeah, sorry to, to actually answer your question, Pat. Um, from a financial sector, what we're seeing is is the um, sacrification of money. So the bitcoins and everything uh, of that manner, and the blockchain. Um, looking at kind of how are we going to handle um, the credit defaults and default swaps and things like that from a financial standpoint with this digital currency. Um, it's really unprecedented. I haven't seen much regulation involved around it. Um, it's going to be a, an interesting world as, as it becomes more and more relevant to the layperson. Uh, healthcare. So yeah. within healthcare, um, the compliance, uh, the regulatory space is changing rapidly and it's been very difficult to understand uh, the standards and controls that are going to be used across the industry. So everybody's sort of using their best effort right now of the technologies that we know around you know, encryption and, and, and uh, more secure protocols. Um, but since there's really not a definitive guideline and now you know, changing with the political landscape that kind of and government is trying to you know, regulate the standard, that's even a little bit scarier and more challenging because we do have potentially solutions in the private sector that are going to be overlooked because government and political officials feel like their standards going to be better. May not, may be, may not be, um, but it's an about a rapidly evolving space, it's a challenging one. And earlier, one of you referred to us as kind of being the group of no, which is often said that the security team is no, you can't do that. But enough negativity and worrying. What are some of the things that you think the security field does really well? Yeah, sure. Actually, one of the last one, but I guess I probably should play the injury. Um, if you really, you don't mind? No. Okay. Um, my selfish glory moment. Um, the last thing, the biggest challenge in my subjective opinion, is that we are not, as practitioners in our community, mentoring and controlling and guiding the industrialization of our workforce. Um, we have people with Security Plus that have five days uh, in the industry of experience that are working in droves. Um, those people and these children in these projects of innovation and STEM, they're popping up every other block. We don't have the best mentors or ethical framework references for them to meet the demand. Um, our policymakers, I competed in the Cyber 912 Challenge over the summer. Um, I was probably the only person there that had ever actually worked on the Benning Network, which is really good to see all these kids coming from Ivy University talking about policy. 
I actually went there as a social project with the CBG to do a white paper that's coming out soon to talk about the socialization of cybersecurity and to see the difference in the definition of what someone my age that's working on a PhD in political science has for me as a PhD I'm working on IAS. So in 10 years, it's good for me to sit down and actually see what their think is coming, and it's totally different. So I'm talking about the policymaker definition. If people like Mudge and DT have been working as advocates uh, for years, um, and no one's, it's, it could have a much more drastic impact if they had listened to them the way they do now. So investing into your tier one person now is absolutely pinnacle to your success in the future. Um, sorry, but that, that's, that's just what I'm saying for the community part. Be more practitioners. We'll come back on that. This is the next question. But negativity and worry, yeah, absolutely. Everyone needs to be optimistic in this. Like, if the ship is burning, I'm the guy that's like, it's cool, we got this. Don't worry about it. It's only like three gigs of data. We can probably get that back, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's good, though, is that your bank card works still, right? I don't know. It's all century. Um, they probably just should be one of the mail that's telling me. Because you know, um, the kicker. But no, some of these things here feels really well. So we're actually going to go back into that coin there. I've seen uh, the hackerspace situation, right? You have a lot of really phenomenally talented people that are doing better things on their off-duty time than their 9 to 5 working as a security practitioner. And we, I won't drive into that later, but I really do think that's what we're doing well. We are working as the middle piece better now, I think, than we honestly ever have in the industry. You have CSOs that are going out of their lanes and doing things like going to the Masters and golfing with their CEO because they know that might be what it needs to take to get their team to, to victory in the next year. Um, and it's back in the day that would have been never even heard of. The security guy <laughs> like, didn't even have an, you know, a full seat at the board. Um, so I think we're doing really well today and bringing ourselves out of our comfort zone. I did it all. Andy, what are we doing well? I don't know. Thorn conferences. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a hard one because you have to sort of step back and say, you know, what is our job, right? Fundamentally, our job is to enable better risk choices. And so are we doing that? Or is, are the industries that we're protecting thriving? And are we helping contribute to that? You know, I might say that like naming vulnerabilities might actually be the thing we did most well over the last three years. <laughs> um, and look, I know a lot of people are opposed to it, right? They talk about you know the Jeep Cherokee being stunt hacking, and why do we have to have a logo for Heartbleed and Image Tragic and all this other stuff? But let's put it this way: How many people besides Larry can name CVEs by number? Right? And sort of I'm the talk. CVE guy, and I can't. There we go. <laughs> See. Right? We can't you know, continue to think of our industry as being this arcane thing. We have to be part of and we, which means we have to market ourselves. And I think we are doing better at marketing ourselves. And everybody understood that they had to do something because of Heartbleed. Like everybody across every business. Right? And when I talked with somebody, uh, we recently were, were hiring and he came in and he said, yeah, you know, Heartbleed was a boon for me. You know, my previous job, I'm like, why? He said, well, because for the first time I could say, we have to do this thing and patch servers and nobody argued with me. <laughs> right? That's fantastic that we're actually able to communicate up to the layperson even as our systems are getting more complicated. Yeah, uh, I agree. <laughs> I don't, don't want to go too much on, a, on the same similar rant, but the socializing of security. You know, for the longest time, the security guy was someone in a dark room in a dark corner, doing you know whatever security people did, even if, even if they had a security guy or girl. And I think the ability to now you know understand that there is a human aspect to it, and being out there and talking to people, and um, I work very hard to be the social face of security. I walk around, I put my ear to the ground, I. You know, people see me kind of wandering the halls, and that's how I get good information. I learn about, hey, you know, what are you working on? What did you see? Oh, I had this weird pop up. Oh, well, you know, just call the help desk. <laughs> well, yeah, I just clicked on this weird email. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. well, thank you. Um, <laughs> but I'm serious. Be becoming that social aspect, and I think we're doing a better job of it. I think that we have a face, we have a name. Um, uh, you know, security B sides. I don't know how long you guys been doing this. Uh, Six or seven years. Four. Six or seven years, but I think we're making that progress. You know, six or seven years ago, this wasn't here. Um, so, get out there, put a face to it. 
it's funny, I, occasionally somebody will poke fun at me for the amount of ping pong I play, but it's like the best source of information <laughs> that, that, I you. that I have. I mean, be, being social is so critically important to the role. Right? If, you, if you're not willing to walk around, and again, I talked about it a little earlier, go from the top of the stack, your CEO, all the way down to a junior developer, help desk person, they, it's, it's probably not a great role, role for you because you're going to get disconnected from the organization. Uh, I would say, as, as far as the uh, as optimism, I think that the security community, uh, yeah, I've talked about it a different way uh, at a few different uh, talks, but you know, we're really a young industry, right? People that saw me at Source on Wednesday, one of the things I said was that um, you know, we legitimately in the late 80s through the 90s were a bunch of you know, teens or young adults, or in some cases, kids breaking into shit. And then we woke up in like the early 2000s, <laughs> and we're like, holy crap, this is like an industry that people care about. It. <laughs> yes. And so we're really young, and a function of that maturation, some of which has been good, or, uh, and some of which honestly has been bad. Uh, but one of the fantastic things that we've seen is we've seen our, our community become more open and accepting. So, I mean, he, he, you know, Andy alluded to this earlier with holding conferences. If it was not that long ago when you'd roll up to DEF CON and people didn't know who you were, like you were going to be bored, you weren't welcome, like it, it was just a different experience than, than you have now a lot of events. Sure. Yeah. And I might add one more thing, I'm going to jump onto the third rail you always have to be really careful of as a white male to talk about diversity. Um, but if I was at a conference like this <laughs> five years ago, it would not have been 25% female, or at least outwardly female in case anybody's presenting differently, um, in, the, in a room. Right? That was not our industry. Our industry was pretty much white male. If you weren't white male, you, you felt like the outsider because nobody knew who you were. And I'm sure Sonia probably has some stories of those days. But that's a fantastic change. We are not a community that is insular and only one demographic. So I think that's a thing we're doing well at, but that's well by comparison of um, we were horrible several years ago, true, not true. well by comparison of we should just be done. Don't suck as bad as we used to. Yeah, we don't suck as badly as we used to, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, look, I'll take that. That's that's always the first step. Acceptance. And Mark, how about in higher ed? Uh, higher ed in general, well, I think one of the things we're doing well is we're communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. um, we're sharing information in ways that we haven't done previously. And hell, even the government's starting to get better at it. Uh, and that's that's unique. Uh, and not only are they sharing information better with themselves, but they're sharing that information with others, which is even more important. And we're sharing it back with them. And I think that helps us all. Um, higher ed has always been relatively good at that. Um, as Adam will probably attest when he was back in his days of higher ed. So long ago. Um, we, we share information a lot. We talk about how good vendors are, how badly their tech support or their tier support you know, is, um, whether we would buy a product or not. Um, we share indicators of compromise very quickly amongst ourselves. Uh, and now I'm seeing more initiatives where higher ed is partnering with the business, is partnering with like government to, to collaborate and share those kind, kinds of information. And it's, it's really helping my day-to-day -day job uh, to get that so I think that's one of the things that we're doing well and we're doing better on. Did you want to add anything, Sonia? Yeah, I would just say the collaboration. I mean, I, you would think that security professionals would not be a very open bunch, but I don't know if it's the therapeutic value that comes from getting around the table with a few <laughs> beers. I mean, the stories I hear would, you know, we curl your hair. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, but that's refreshing to me because it kind of, it keeps me aligned with what I feel like my strategy and my priorities are going to be for the next year. It's, it's sort of a, it's sort of, you know, um, throwing things on the wall, making, you know, having them stick, um, just kind of reiterating the value of, of what I'm doing day to day. Um, so I think collaboration is what we're doing well and that we need to do more of it. And I think it needs to be uh, you know, security is not security across every industry, and I constantly seek out people in my vertical to understand what their particular problems are because programs are going to look very different. I mean, you have baseline, you know, firewall uh, architecture discussions at a you know security forum like this, but when you get into healthcare, you get into banking, things become very different very quickly. And um, with the amount of monies that we get in the nonprofit sector, we re really have to be very careful about where we invest and who we invest with. I just have one more question. I want to. I you, so, Sonia just uh, say, said something that I think it gave, gave me an anecdote I remember from a couple of years ago that drives home pretty much a good chunk of what you just heard. 
I was standing at DerbyCon two years ago. Der DerbyCon's in Louisville it's in September each year. I think they're having their sixth one this year. Uh, and every year, consecutively, they've broken the record of the, including the Kentucky Derby weekend, of the Hyatt in Louisville's amount of alcohol sold and consumed. And, and so they always have uh, police on site uh, when they have large events. And like it was like 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning. I was competing in the CTF, and I was just kind of taking a walk, and I talked to one of the cops, and he's like, I've, he's like, I've never seen anything like this before. And like you like got like completely obliterated people playing like complex variants of chess. Like some guys are talking about like high fee headers and like, weird action <laughs> referee issues. And it's just not something you this see. This is vacation. Any other it's and only on like, vacation. Like, I mean, that's just cool. <laughs> Right. So we're drinking well. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> liver doing a nice job drinking, everyone. So we're a bunch of alcohol. That was the takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> the takeaway. Got it. Functional, liver functional, functional alcohol. Function. I think was the takeaway. Self medicating. <laughs> so before we can go all sit around a table and have a beer, I just have one last <laughs> question. So, no so how would you say that your team is or your team can impact the community, both local and abroad? John, do you want to start with that one? Yeah. So. Um, we dying here? Can, can you hear me? Okay, sir. Uh, I don't know how to even explain that. Like, I'm an ISC chapter president, and I think when we're working with things like our OWAS, we have a total chapter. I mean, we just don't stop. Um, it's pretty much the mission is B-sides every day. Uh, two of us are finishing up at HCI SPP uh, boot camp curriculum. We're going to start doing uh, locally about 90 people a year in the medical college system there for free. Um, I mean, literally just don't stop every single day be an advocate. We've been on the Barnes & Noble, some folks on the group, um, and basically just work to teach people like how the 3D printer actually understands what it's doing um, from programming and security, but advocating. Like I'll have dinner with the mayor the next week to talk about the economic development direction and cybersecurity. In two weeks, I'll be sitting with one other person who we volunteered to be a community courts counsel to help uh, children with the Juvenile Conquer Prevention Initiative um, in STEM. Um, as well as developmental disabilities. So in the nonprofit, we're employing three front end developers recently um, who have developmental disabilities. So to summarize it, don't stop, hack the world, and have a good time drinking beer with each other. I guess along the way, you know, Inception, just bring everyone in. Um, my CEO is going to go with us tonight and have a party and meet some awesome people. Uh, everybody should do that. Josh, do you have anything about how you're impacting the local security committee? Because everybody, is it because, is it because we, we had uh, one, two, or four, four or five people speak. Uh, no, I think it's, like, it's exactly what he said. I think that, um, you know, A, always push the envelope and then talk about it. Right? One of the problems is the industry got, like, they got caught in this rut. Yes. And uh, because people that aren't new to the industry or are new to the industry wanted to get out and they wanted to do best practices. The problem is best practices are broken. And so new best practices don't happen until people experiment and then talk about them and talk about what's worked and what hasn't worked and you iterate on them and you get better. And so the only way it will get better is if all of us experiment, push the envelope, and then come together and talk about what worked and what didn't work. So is uh, anyone in here working in this, like a state, local, municipality? Okay. <laughs> That's, that's my charity work. Um, our municipalities department where we do uh, a lot of the banking for you know town, uh, town of whatever, light and power, things like that. Um, you would be surprised a lot of the security. So I have built this 10 page, they call it my security bible. And whenever we bring on a new client, and when I got here I went through all of our existing clients, uh, I sit down with them in their security department and I go over, hey, um, when you're sending our you know ACH transfer, you really shouldn't use port 21 for that. And we go over a lot of those things. So um, I, I try to make as most as I can to expand our security and our posture internally uh, to our customers. And, and we work a lot with municipalities in that sense of trying to bring them up to the year 2016. Yeah. Just want to say thank you to Andy, Josh, Adam, Mark, John, Sonia. Thank you for doing this. And thank all of you for making this another successful B-Sides.